Thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. Thank you for being at the show. I, my name is Jonathan Irwin. I work with the Halloween Party Expo. And I also, uh, when I'm not uh, in this role, I also uh, am involved with acquiring helium for a, a chain of party supply stores myself. So I have a definite interest in this topic, as, as, as you do. Um, I want to do a quick introduction to the panelists, and I want to get right into it since we're, we have a pretty, pretty tight time frame this morning. Um, at the far end of the table, we have Tim Parker. He is the business manager for hydrogen and helium with air gas. Um, in the middle is Marty Fish. He is the executive director of the International Balloon Association. And at the other end of the table, we have Steve. He's with Balloon Designers and Aerodeco Video. And he is responsible for the incredible jack-o'-lantern balloon sculpture and also the spiders that you all walked under coming into the show every morning. So um, we've got a, a great panel covering a, uh, the, the breadth of the field. So let's, without further ado, let's get started. Um, Tim, just for those of, you, those of our audience that may not know the, the complete root of the uh, helium shortage, could you give us a a quick down and dirty rundown of, of why there is a helium shortage and uh, go into sort of how long you think it's going to last. Okay. If you the, know. The, the current uh, shortage probably started about 18 months ago. And uh, unlike the shortage from about four years ago, this is really more of a supply situation, not a demand situation. Um, and for those of you who don't know, helium comes from roughly about nine sources globally. Uh, currently, the U.S. is a major, major supplier of helium to the world. Uh, the U.S. is a net exporter of helium. And to answer the question as to really what precipitated the, the current predicament is, um, it was a combination of um, equipment and production issues, as well as uh, existing facilities going down for scheduled maintenance. and. <clears throat> On top of that was a reduced demand of natural gas from probably specifically Algeria, which led to a major reduction Sorry, in uh, production at the two Algerian facilities. So um, you, you can't really point to one specific uh, problem, but I hate to use the, f the term the perfect storm, but their true layering effect of uh, many facilities that either had reduced production went down for scheduled or unscheduled maintenance and or had equipment issues. And again, um, unlike the previous time where demand was really the main problem, uh, this was truly just a, a supply issue where there was not enough supply to even meet the reduced demand that was out there. And, you know, we, I, we've heard about the Algerian fields and Qatar and other, other uh, sources of helium coming back online. Are, 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 is that... Are you seeing that actually happen, or is that, I, we seem like we've been hearing about it for a couple of years now. <laughs> That's unfortunately yeah. usually how it goes. So these, these facilities, and, and because there are only nine sources, there's obviously very few facilities, and uh, they rarely come on stream on time, and they rarely come on at nameplate production capacity. Um, one of those that is slated to come on stream is in Riley Ridge, it's in Wyoming. Um, it was supposed to have already been on stream 12 months ago. Uh, they're now hoping that it will be on stream uh, June or July. Um, the nice thing is it's a source that's in the U.S. The unfortunate thing is it's, it's not going to be a major source. Just to give you an idea, the current nameplate production globally is about 6 to 7 billion cubic feet. Uh, the new source, the Riley Ridge source, is only going to be 200 million. So it's a relative drop in the bucket, but any new source is a good source today. So that's something that's been delayed already 13 months. Uh, it's now expected to come on stream in about six months. Uh, Algeria, there, there's still continued issues going on. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the tragedy that just happened there recently. That was not one of the healing natural gas fields, but it easily could have been. Um, Algeria is a very tough place to do business. Uh, their business model is, is very different from what most people would think. And uh, I would not be surprised if Algeria has continuing problems for the, for the next couple of years. Uh, the, the, the next big thing, though, is Qatar, too. Um, and you alluded to that. And again, just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking here, with a global production capacity of 6 to 7 billion, Qatar, too, um, is supposed to come on at about 1.3 billion. So it's going to be a major improvement in supply. 
Uh, it's, it's actually slated to come on stream early. Uh, it was supposed to come on late 2013, early 2014. It's now uh, scheduled to come on June, July of this year. Uh, there will be a ramp up period, but if things go as planned, um, and, uh, what we're told comes true, uh, we would expect the plant to be at full production capacity at the end of 2013. Uh, and uh, obviously Qatar is out in the Middle East um, and uh, will not be sending product to the U.S. But what the benefit to the U.S. will be is that product will go to serve markets previously supplied by the U.S. So uh, they'll hit Europe, they'll hit uh, Africa, and possibly even over to Asia. So that will allow product that is produced here in the U.S. to stay in the U.S. rather than going overseas. Thank you. Uh, Marty, I know you've been uh, through your work with the International Balloon Association and been dealing with some of the, uh, the, the current legislation that's in the works, possibly to help ease the shortage. Could you uh, tell us, if you, you know, give us a sense for what legislation is, 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 help, is exacerbate, exacerbating the problem, sorry, and what is potentially in line that could maybe ease the shortage? Oh. I think I might have to hold this up closer to me. Um, that's a, that's a, that, there, there, there's a lot of information in that question. Sure. I know. <laughs> I'll try to keep it, you know, in terms that relate to everybody in this room right. because I'm thinking what you mainly want to know is when am I going to get helium easily again? And, right. and the legislation that uh, we're talking about is the legislation regarding the actual helium here in Texas, the Federal Helium Reserve. And it is, the, the only reason question about it or any legislation even involved with it at this point in time is because it was federally produced and, and, and the helium in the ground was is there because our government felt it was a strategic resource, you know, 60, 70 years ago and started uh, storing it there. And that was why we have such, that's why we have such a great supply here in the United States. Well, it's also been, it's also been legislated as of in 19, back in 1996 that the government really didn't need all that helium any longer and all the money that the taxpayers spent to um, help put it there, produce it and put it there needed to be paid back. So in 1996, they decided that the government would slowly, you know, use it up, sell it off, and pay the taxpayer back. And it was slated to be done by 2015. And that's the Helium Privatization Act that you may, you may have read about. That is the, the newspaper. He, yeah, Helium uh, Privatization Act of 1996. And so, therefore, um, private refiners were allowed to um, pull helium from it, pay for it. And that was, that's the process of paying back the taxpayer, basically. Well, that's due to expire, and there's still helium there. We still need the government operation to keep going. It's managed by the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM. So we need that to, to continue on so that we can continue getting our supply of helium. So the legislation we're talking about deals with um, you know, extending that and making sure that the BLM continues to operate and continues to pull helium out of the ground and supply it to us and through, through private refiners. And there's also, so, so there's, there's, a, there's a bill, it's been proposed, the Helium Stewardship Act of 2012, to make that continue on. There's now uh, some other, uh, an, an alternative um, draft legislation that's going on, and that's, that's been adopted by the Senate and in the House of Representatives, the committee that is involved with that particular effort um, is looking at maybe amending that a little bit and changing that and allowing more um, non-refiners access. So there's some tit for tat going on there. Bottom line is, it's going to happen this year. I believe by October of 2013. So our legislators are actually going to, you know, the so-called helium cliff is going to happen and it will have to happen by this, this year. And so that will be resolved. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yes, no, thank you. I, and I, I know that the IBA is involved with some lobbying efforts to 
to on this issue. Can you just give okay, us a quick Okay, the right IBA out? directly is not. I'm okay. not up there in Washington, you know, testifying in front of the House and all that. Um, on behalf of the balloon industry, we do have the Balloon Council, and the Balloon Council is sort of our legislative. Uh, IBA represents, we have manufacturer, distributor, retailer, decorator, entertainer members. The Balloon Council has, um, has the ear of the, of the lobbyists on efforts regarding protections for the balloon industry. It can, it can be, uh, more recently it is involved in, in preventing laws against uh, banning helium filled balloons in California. If you, any of you are from California, you're very familiar with that. So it's the Balloon Council that is doing the, doing the research, and they do have lobbyists, and they do have people uh, on the ground collecting data and research on this. And we do not have a lobbying group, per se, that's, that's working with these bills, but we will if we need to. Okay. Thank you. Steve, you talked about the sort of the root cause for where we are in the legislation and the supply chain. Getting down to more of a practical level, in your own business, um, what are you doing to conserve helium or to, or to find other ways to, to, to decorate and inflate balloons without using helium? Well, I've been actually very fortunate in regards that in my, I started in the industry as an entertainer. I started making balloon animals and that kind of thing uh, because I had no life. And um, then eventually I got into decorating in the aspect of it and I realized that I could do the same thing just on a much bigger scale. So from the beginning of my um, journey through this, I've been, I do as much helium as retailers do. Um, that, and that's kind of, so the helium shortage has affected me, and it's affected everyone in the industry, uh, but the, I, I don't want this statement taken the wrong way. Um, the decorators, decorators and, and retailers who rely on helium as their level of creativity are dramatically affected by this. And, and, and I've always said from the beginning, if, don't get me wrong, there's incredibly beautiful balloons here, there's incredibly beautiful products here that you know, everyone should go out and buy and sell and what have you. But if, if you can buy that balloon, your competitor can buy that balloon, and the other competitor can buy that balloon, and the box store can buy it cheaper than you can, you're all blowing up the same balloons and you're all selling it. So the key to success in this situation is to create pieces they can't find anywhere else. Uh, in the retail aspect of it, it's, it's what's called out the door decor which you're creating little carry-out items that you would take with you. So that's what I'm seeing the retail side of things do more and more of. They're, they're trying to create more and more small, portable decor items that when their customers come in, they look at, they go, wow, those are really cute. They're substantially less than what a decorator would charge because you know, you're know you doing it in store, what have you, and they're taking it with them. Right. So again, now of course, when you know it, the day that I got cut off from helium was two weeks before I had like the big helium job coming up. Um, so obviously it does happen, it is impacted. Um, but what we've done as, as professionals is just basically find a way to guide the customer away from helium products, if possible. Um, there's sometimes, you know, there's sometimes they absolutely want what they want and that's when you are careful. You asked about reserving helium or trying to preserve helium. Um, one of the steps that we take now specifically, I mean, latex balloons pop, that just, it just happens. So now, whenever we have to fill a latex balloon, we absolutely pre-inflate every balloon with air. We stretch it out and test it to make sure that the balloon's not flawed. Because there's nothing worse than putting, uh, you know, putting high float and putting helium inside of a balloon and then having it pop. Actually, that's a product that's completely wasted. Well now, especially with the helium situation, every, every cubic inch you can get is, is vital. So you know, that's one thing that you can do. Is it time consuming? Yes. Does it take up, you know, yeah, is it, you know, some would argue that it's you know, a waste, but I would even argue that number one, you're gonna make sure your product's good and you're not gonna waste helium. And secondly, provide a better product to your client. Because when a balloon is stretched out before you inflate it with helium and then you high float it, the high float actually works itself into the microscopic cracks in the balloon and actually works better. So it's a better way to improve your product at the same time. So um, basically just focus on you know, air filled pieces and really, really push air filled. Again, being a sculptor, that helps a lot. There's very little helium, and there's no helium in the jack-o'-lantern. 
and there's very little helium in the spider legs, just in the top portion. So we're, you know, we're trying to avoid it as much as we can. And if we had to, the designs could have been completely helium free. We could have just rigged the legs. It would have been distracting in my opinion. Right. Which is why we chose to go with the helium route. But you mentioned high float. Do you do you use a sixty forty valve when you're inflating, or do you just use straight helium? I've not gotten to that point yet, but that's because of the fact uh, that again, I don't use that much helium in my day to day operation. But that is specifically. I at the same time, I don't use a lot. I do a lot of deliveries, but I don't do a lot of plush. Right. I don't buy a lot of specific physical items that I have to keep in inventory. As a balloon person, I have the ability to create anything I want out of balloons. So that's my unique niche so in that right. regard. So I haven't gotten to that point yet with the 6040, but I do know several people that have. In certain parts of the country, it's, been, it's proven very successful for them. In other parts of the country, uh, like in Denver, for example, it's my understanding they can't even really use a 6040 right. because of the Yeah, that's, what, that's my understanding. Stuff. So, um, so yeah. Did, I hope that answered the no, question. No, that was great. Thank you. Uh, Marty, for you know, a lot of retailers, you know, Steve is obviously incredibly talented and knows what he's doing with balloons. For a lot of retailers where you're, you've just got maybe you know, high school kid helping in the afternoon for your balloons, have you seen anything at the show? Or are you aware of any products out there that are, that are designed to help retailers create air-filled uh, decor that in a, in a, it's you know, maybe simpler or it doesn't require a designer to, to do? Well, this is probably a better question for Steve again, but I have seen uh, every manufacturer, balloon manufacturer, is creating designs now that are made of, um, some of them have the, uh, the, the fabric themselves, the materials they're made of, the, the plastic uh, film, is, uh, is lighter weight and it's, uh, they're designed to float longer. So those are the products I would seek out if you're going to use helium in those kinds of balloons. Use the, the kinds of valves on your tanks that won't pop a balloon. You know, you can't over inflate them. There are those, there are, most of the valves out there today are, are designed that way. So you definitely want to use a, a valve that's designed for helium inflation because it will, it has a, a sense in it that it knows when to stop. With foils. With foils. For foils, yes, not with latex, but with foils. That prevents the waste with the, the teenage after school help that he was talking about that's inflating balloons. And then um, go to classes, really. There, there's lots of them out there. And, and the distributors put on these programs in your local area. And um, Steve puts on, a, a, produces an event in St. Louis, for example, next week called Float. There are, there are engines out there, and you really should go and educate yourselves about how to create designs. They're using more air. You can use some helium and some air, and, and, and create, and have, and, and have those sitting around in your store and ready to go. It's kind of like uh, cash and carry. You don't even have to stop and inflate it. And, and those are the ideas that I'm seeing coming out of all the different booths here in the, on the balloon side. So, so there's multiple ways to save helium uh, with, with equipment, with inflation devices, with the balloons themselves that they're coming out with today, but also with using those same balloons and filling them with air and creating a little, you know, tabletop type design sculpture. Right. Right. David, you want to add something to that? If you don't mind, if I could expand just a little bit on what Marty was talking about. Uh, just wandering around the show back and forth doing refresh work. I've noticed a couple of booths that actually do have, uh, as you were talking about, plastic stemware type arrangement elements where you can simply just blow up your foils and stick them on this plastic stand, which can then be modified into a centerpiece or into a delivery piece or what have you. Uh, as far as latex is concerned, the absolute best way that I have found to save helium is with a, it's a device created by Conwin called a uh, split second dual sizer. It is an expensive machine. It's about $1,200. But the reality is, is that once you get it set to where you know it works for your sizing, you never overinflate a latex balloon. So you're always inflating, and you're, and you're inflating consistently. You're creating consistently full balloons every time. Um, again, it's a heck of an investment, especially if you're just thinking that, well, I've got teenagers blowing up balloons at the shop. But the reality is, in the long term, you're going to save considerably amount of money, or considerable amount of money on both product and helium if you're using a sizing device of that nature. 
And the beautiful thing about the dual second, uh, the split second dual sizer is that you can actually do two at a time. So if you have orders where you're you know, trying to catch up on a busy Saturday, you can actually inflate two balloons at once using the same size, same template, everything, and it does it for you. You just hit a foot pedal and it's done. Um, I, I can't say enough how much that, that device has changed my business in general. The things that we build here could never have been done without them. That's great. Thank you. You know, can I just add something? To sure. You? you know, from a cylinder point of view, one of the things that you can also do is, if you're not going to turn your cylinder off when you go home at night, uh, helium is a very small molecule. If there's a leak, it's going to find it. And a lot of times the regulators that you put on the cylinder are going to leak, whether it's not tightened properly or maybe just the diaphragm and the regulator just leaks the helium. So I would recommend if you're not doing it when you go home at night, turn the valve off. The valve is very, very leak free, specifically for helium. And the best way to conserve it is not to lose it, you know, and, and that's just lost helium. So again, just turn your cylinders off and then turn them on in the morning. That's great. great. Thank you. And I want to I want to leave time for I know we'll probably have questions from the audience, but I, I do have one more question I want to ask you, Tim. It's in terms of if, if, if you are a retailer out there today and you're you're trying to secure a su supply of helium, do you do you have any tips or pointers on the best way to do that, or is it pretty? Are we pretty much in the situation where you either have a long-term contract or someone available, you know, local that's still got a little supply, or you're just out of luck? It's it's going to be tough. I'm, I don't want to say you're out of luck be, because you're not, but you know, uh, air gas. We we were forced to shed a lot of non-contract customers. Um, and that was due to the fact that we were allocated and, and obviously we needed to provide contractually those customers uh, that we did have under contract. So uh, one of the best ways is to have a long-term contract um, and, and that way you can at least be guaranteed some supply. Uh, it's not going to guarantee you maybe what you want, but uh, I, I would also think that a lot of our competitors are not taking on new customers. We are not taking on new customers right now. Um, and. Uh, a long-term contract will help you. There are opportunities and there are people out there who sell, um, so you'll need to look for those opportunities and, and the supply could be erratic at times, um, but uh, it, it, you can get helium, it's just gonna make it that much more difficult. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm sure some of you have questions. Uh, anybody like to ask the panelists any questions? Uh, the question was, um, and Tim, this may be something you can answer, is, is is there any way for someone to know what they really, what they ought to be paying on a, at, the, at a market rate? I know it's, if, it's, it's if tough you've got a contract, I mean, you know. But. The, the, that's one of the contract. Hopefully that would at least give you an idea of what your expected increases could be. Um, so for those that don't have a contract, you're buying in the spot market, and those are going to be people who are buying through maybe two or three different people to get that volume. So it's going to be very difficult to answer your question. The other thing that I will say is, geographically, uh, certain areas are better supplied than others. And so you're going to see, uh, and, and, and this is true for even air gas, our suppliers geographically have, have very good supply points and have areas where we're not even getting product from them, even though they're contractually obligated to supply us. So um, geographically, you'll pay different prices. Um, what I will say, though, is even with new supply coming on, I wouldn't necessarily expect prices to go down. Uh, this is going to be coming out of Qatar, um, and while yes, more product will stay in the U.S., helium is a global product. It's it's fairly easily shippable to any place in the world. Uh, the supply chains are already in place, so new product is coming on, and it's not cheap. Uh, so, I, I guess to answer your question. I, I, I don't have a specific answer for you in terms of what you should be paying for a cylinder, but what I would say is um, even with new supply, I wouldn't expect prices to drop. They, they may hopefully remain stagnant for some time, but uh, I, w I would expect helium costs for even people like air gas to continue to rise. The range that I've experienced has been, well, I originally I, I was originally based out of Cincinnati, and when I signed my contract, I was getting, I think I was paying rates. Um, I was at one time paying $72 for a 291 tank. Then when I moved to Seattle, my contract came with me, which of course the local vendor there was shocked because it was about $50 more for the same tank, but I still maintained, because I had the contract, I was still maintaining that. 
now I'm hearing from the general public and from people I've talked to here at the show and everything else, anywhere from on the average of 120 to a 200 dollars for a 291, which is or 300 as many people refer to it, the big tanks. Um, 600? Is that what you're saying? Wow. Yeah, you've got somebody taking real advantage of that. Um, but I but I can honestly tell you though that when someone calls me now wanting to rent a tank, I mean, I've only got one. If you want to rent my helium, you're going to pay premium price on it. But that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty steep. I've heard a lot of people saying they're not renting tanks anymore just because of the shortage. Is anybody out in the audience, are you still renting tanks to customers that come in? Still are? It's, uh, it's well, if you, then, you're out, then you're adequately supplied. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Because most, yeah, most aren't. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, how do the dollar stores sell them for so cheap? You know, I, you know, my assumption would be that either they're, you know, they're they're buying the they buy a lot. They're buying a lot. Of, it's just a volume situation. Yeah. Um, but I, I, from what I understand, even so, I, I know in some of the markets where our stores are, some of the dollar stores are now out of helium yeah. as well. Right. Same mine. Yep. In fact, all, all the dollar stores are supplied by one particular vendor who actually cut the dollar stores off in favor of the independent outfits, people like me. Because what they said to the dollar stores are, you have a thousand other things you can sell for a dollar. He's got one. And he's got to feed his family or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I mean, in that regard, so, so not, I mean, money doesn't always, you know, the money isn't always what's guiding these people. Sometimes there are ethics involved. It's right. nice to see. No, we've, had, we've had similar experiences to yeah. our markets. Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's party time. Not time. Right. Right. Who supplies those? Is that there? Praxair here used to. I don't know. It's, it's Worthington. Do you mind sharing where, where, where are your stores located? You're in Canada. You, you, I don't know if any, the panelists had any, any experience with that. Right. I, you know, in, in terms of what you have to do in a regulatory situation, I think that's got to be location by location. I know that the that the the, the, the cylinders, the, the take-home cylinders we buy, we're, they're becoming in a lot shorter supply also. That they're, they will get them. They'll, they'll, they're, they're almost constantly back ordered. I don't know if anyone else has similar experience with that. Well, the other thing to keep in mind too is that if you buy one of those party time tanks and and the top should shear off, it's not going to go through a concrete wall. Right. I mean that's one of the reasons why they're so insistent. I mean there's a lot of safety issues involved with compressed tank rentals and versus one that can hold 29 inch balloons. There's it's much safer. Yeah, I think that's yeah. They, you know the 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 big you know we. We always tell our stores, you know, the 300 is basically, if it falls over, it's a torpedo. That's yeah. exactly right. No That's and exactly right. the smaller tanks, it's, you know, they, we, they get rolled around and hit with forklifts fairly frequently. Yeah. <laughs> they, don't, yeah. they don't seem to cause as much problem. I don't know if that, if that, if that helps. Right. Yeah, your smaller tanks are, yeah. I, I think it just it's just a it's just a different the, the, if you're talking about the the party time tanks I think it's just a it's kind of a different beast. I don't no. think so. I th no. Because they're not using high right. flow. Right. They're using right. crappy yeah, balloons. They're, they're using, well, that's, they're using yeah, balloons, the balloons that aren't 100 percent latex probably right. le lesser right. expensive balloons and they're also not high floating them right. and. And they're nine inch size. And they're not 11 inch. Yeah, right, I mean, right. you know, the, the amount of helium you actually put in an object it affects the float time greatly sure. yeah. from even from and I, Well, if, if I'm not mistaken, a nine inch, if I'm not mistaken, a nine inch balloon on its own has a rough float life of about six hours, uh, as opposed to a decorator grade 11 inch like Qualitex or Vitalik uses, I mean, you'll get, you'll get 20 hours easy out of it without helium, without high float. High float. You put high float in it, which, Best invention ever for the latex balloon world. Um, in, in certain markets, I mean, I've had my balloon float for a month. Wow. Yeah. So. Well, I. Yeah. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. 
especially. Well, I know at our stores, we used to, and if someone would bring in balloons, we would charge them some nominal fee and inflate the balloons for them. And we stopped doing that when the, because the, we'd get dollars for our balloons and they would explode and the customer would be mad at us and want us to pay for their balloon and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just wasn't worth it anymore, especially not with the lack of helium. But. Any other questions? I think that depends. My experience it depends on where you are. We've we've have my store, our stores are in Texas and we have pretty good luck with the flow, with the flow time. You know, it's we we tell the customer you know don't come in a week before your party and pick up your <laughs> balloons. You know, it's it's definitely not like if you have a secure. But I don't over the panels have any other ex experiences from other locations. Again, I I don't yeah. use one, but I would presume about sixty percent or forty percent less. Yeah, yeah. forty percent less time. But with high float, it's obviously going to last longer than a balloon that's sent out the door without high float, even with 100% helium in it. So um, there's, if I had, had any uh, final message to give to everybody at this show or in this section, and that is, yes, helium is affecting uh, your balloon business. I mean, it will if you let it. Um, it's changing the way we have to do business, but it doesn't mean that we can't still rock balloons. And that's the, I think that's the best message we can remember. We do have to evolve, things change. You know, the economy has just been crazy these last few years, as you well know. And we do have to evolve and change in the way we do business, and this is just one more aspect of that. But balloons are forever going to be the party. And you are in a unique position to where you can still be a part of that. In fact, be the creative part of that and be even more creative where it's not just a balloon on a string anymore. You have to bring more value and we will. And, and I, I almost want to say that this is helping our industry to become more value added in the way we do balloons. And it will raise in your in the consumer's eye, the level of what uh, the value of balloons are because of you. And you, you need to go and get that education. You need to learn more about how to be more creative and learn from some of these experts that are around have been doing it a long time. And they aren't, you know, and, 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 and they're making a living. They do well with what they do. So you can do that too. Well, I think that's about as well as we could wrap up this, this discussion. I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I know that, that they're, they're, they're all exhibitors here, so if you have any other questions, I think they'll be here the, the rest of the day, and you can go, go talk to them. Um, again, thank you all for being here, and I, I hope this has been helpful.